this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. Colonel Frans for you. One Ricky commander, second in command at four Ricky, three two battalion Ricky wing. You know, it's, it's a story, yeah? And we got a lot of him today as well. And there's a couple of questions which you uh, left uh, below the last video. The second one, the, the Ricky wing at three two battalion, we will answer those. But first, I have to say that this in Pretoria is not on his farm. And since we have a bit of power cuts and you know, it's come the usual things in South Africa. Uh, he's at his son or son in law's uh, place of business right now. And therefore, he's not at the hospital. There's nothing wrong with Colonel Frost. I just want to tell you in case you see the, the medical doctor way behind him on the picture. Very welcome here, Colonel. As always, we are grateful for you, for your time. Thank you. We're really enjoying your stories. But perhaps you can start by just giving a brief background on where we were, what we were discussing, and then where you are right now. And then we can go to the answers, and then we will go to uh, to one Ricky and the Military Academy. Thank you very, very much. Um, and to everybody that is viewing the, the, the YouTube um, podcast, whatever what you call it. But in any case, um, I really want to thank the people that is... Um, uh, seems to have a, a interest in what we have to say. Thank you very, very much. And as Chris said, um, I do read all the comments and I really want to thank everybody for the compliments and um, don't make me bigger than what I'm really are. Uh, you know, you are, you are picking me up as if I'm a hero, I'm not a hero. So I'm, I'm just Franz Fourie that went through a certain... Uh, a, a, a certain path. Um, Chris, then, uh, once again, thank you to you for roasting and um, for what you are doing behind the scenes. I know it takes hours of editing and whatever, and um, I know you are putting in a lot of effort, and uh, my sincere thanks for that. Chris, I would like to um, just put in context where we've been in, in the past and where I stopped last time. And then um, after that, I would like to answer certain questions that people post on, on uh, the comments columns, and uh, we will do that. The last uh, episode, I stopped where I informed the people that I served in 32 Battalion Reiki Group um, we did various operations and we had um, certain exposures. I did not tell any everything. Um, there was just not enough time. Um, and so there's, there's much more to tell, but that, that is where we went. And then whilst I was in the 32 Battalion Reiki group, uh, I did the Special Forces selection and... Um, I passed the, the, the Special Forces, the Reiki selection, and um, I went back to Amahoni, the Reiki base of 32 Battalion. And when I went back, Savati just was just executed, the, the big operation Savati. So um, there was a lot of activity going on there, but the, the, the guys from the Reiki group was actually still deployed. And I didn't have the chance to, to really greet my mates and friends. And um, then I went to the HQ. I cleared out or cleared out of 32 Battalion. And I headed for Pretoria to, to actually join um, Special Forces or the, the Rekis in the um, common language. Um, of course, uh, the first thing I would like to do is just answer... Um, a question from Flarkis. Uh, Flarkis asked, what happened to Chaka after the incident where he um, aimed shots at, at Blue Kelly and missed him and ran into the bush. We caught him and uh, handed him over and the Board of Inquiry uh, took place. 
Um, we handed over Chaka to the HQ. Um, in fact, I think uh, Major Eli Fulun, Big Daddy, dealt with him. And um, what and, you know, the nature of whatever was done and said and the procedures, I am not aware of. That was an HQ matter and it was dealt with the, uh, by the HQ. What I do know um, is that he was integrated back into the platoons, into the companies, and that he deployed with them um, for a certain time. So, um, you know, I, that's where the last I heard about Chaka, and I never scratched and asked, you know, whatever happened to him. I believe, you know, everything went well. Um, Flaky, so I hope that answers your question in terms of that. And then the the other question is from Nikki Westhuizen um, about my thoughts on executive outcomes and um, Eben Barlow. Um, Nikki, Eben was actually in my time at 32 Battalion Recce Group. Eben was there as a second lieutenant from the engineers. So I, I got to know Eben very, very well. And he's a, he's a very astute person, very clever person, and a live wire. You know, he was really a live wire. Um, but a very, very, very knowledgeable and clever person. Um, Eben also, at the later stage, after I left the Reiki group, actually became a full-fledged member of the 32 Battalion Reiki group. So um, I believe and I think Eben will also admit that, um, you know, his roots in terms of, of uh, unconventional warfare uh, was actually laid and picked up at 32 Battalion. Because there you really, you know, learned what, what bush warfare is all, all about and what uh, mission orientation is all, all about. So... Um, my opinion on Eben, Eben is a very clever guy um, and uh, executive outcomes. Now, after I went to Special Forces in, I think it was 89, um, Eben called me and I was a major at Fort Reconnaissance Regiment at that stage. And um, he said he would like to speak to me. So he's flying down to Cape Town. Can he come and see me? Now, at that stage, I just got married. I had a wife. She was pregnant. And, you know, um, I actually had a good recce career going. Eben visited me. And um, exclusively, we sat um, at Club Mykonos still. And um, <laughs> we, we drank something. And, and Eben told me that he, he was planning to establish executive outcomes that he had uh, gained the contract to um, free a, a certain oil field or take back a certain oil field. And um, it would be a seaward operation. So um, hence talking to me as I was, um, I had a maritime experience being in, in the Four Reconnaissance Regiment, which is a seaward regiment. And uh, he asked me if, if I would be interested and if I would take the lead in, in um, doing whatever had to be done. So I said to, to Eben that, you know, um, I just got married. Uh, my wife is pregnant. I'm having a very good career in, in Special Forces. And um, I will assist him with any knowledge or whatever I can. And um, I will also getting people from for Reiki to actually support his operation um, and, and execute the task. So uh, jumping back to executive outcomes, um, the private military uh, contracting environment, um, as Saki Mare was involved in Aegis and a few others, I was as well. I bumped into Saki in, in Iraq and Afghanistan so um, I, I served in some of those companies, but I did not serve in executive outcomes. However, all my friends um, that was involved with executive outcomes, um, I know 
by the names of Lafras Leighton, um, Chris Groeve, Nick van der Berg, and all those people are close, close friends up to this day. Now, the, the operations and the missions executive outcomes um, pursued during their time in, in Angola, they did a very, very good job. Once again, to the point, like a 32 battalion operation, no nonsense, plan, um, rehearse the operations, have the necessary manpower, execute the task, and they did brilliantly. Um, when they got involved in, in Sierra Leone and some of the other countries, um, there was a company called Sandline. Now, Sandline was um, Tim Spicer. Tim Spicer it is a, he's a British officer. I think he's from the, the, the Queen's Guard. And um, Tim also got me involved in Aegis. And, and I can testify today, Tim is a really a gentleman and he looked after me very, very well. But um, Tim Spicer and Mark Bullo was two of the, or, 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 Tim was the CEO and Mark was the COO at that stage. But I'm just mentioning that to give some contact, context as to with whom executive outcomes dealt with in a later stage of executive outcomes. So, uh, Nikki, I hope I answer your questions. Um, Eben, as a person, good brain, intelligent, know how to fight the African bush war and is up to today solving um, problems um, in, in, in African countries. Um, I want to add something by saying that um, in my own capacity and businesses uh, I dealt with, uh, we also gave proposals to countries and uh, presidents and ministers of defense of, of certain countries. What I can testify today is that um, one must know that if you get involved with a country as a private military contractor, the intelligence services are looking at you very, very closely. By, by the names of um, the American part of it, the CIA and their um, organizations, as well as the British and whomever um, was the, the colonizing country of, of, of the specific country you are dealing with. And um, if, they, if they see you're going to solve the problem, they will net, not let you do it because there's political... Um, internationally, political reasons why they are involved and um, why they don't want the problem to be solved. Because if the problem is solved, it demonstrates a few things. A, um, it shows that because the, the countries are involved with their own military people, but they can't really solve the problem. They can if they want to, but they, but they don't. So if you actually solve the problem, it puts them in a bad light. And, um, you know, the, the, the people of the country see that and, and you actually degrade the military organizations or the countries that's, that's involved there. Now, I know I'm opening my ribs for, for huge critics, but I know with my experience and the experience of some of my colleagues that what I am saying now is true. I have um, physical proof of... Um, documents of, of some of the other countries, national defense forces, where there's paragraphs um, and chapters copied from my documents, um, not only mine, but um, our documents that was implemented just like that, but executed by, by other people. So I'm going to leave that there in terms of um, the private uh, military contractors and, and with Eben and them. Eben solves problems. He knows what he is doing and he recruits um, the best people to execute it. And um, Eben is great. So uh, I know Eben, he's, he's a good person and uh, he does what he says he will do. Um, of course, I would like to move on to my time in Special Forces, the South African Special Forces, the Rekis. So maybe just before I start, 
um, where and you know how I got involved and 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 my career within special forces, maybe just put special forces as a special force into context within the South African environment. Now, um, the South African special forces was actually um, in an embryo form since 1966. In 1966, uh, Colonel Jan Breitenbach, I think he was a captain at that stage with some of the people that was actually former members in 1972 when special forces was formed in South Africa, participated in um, operations in some countries and um, that is really seen as the forerunner of the establishment of special forces in South Africa. So this, the operational successes, uh, which um, Jan Breitenbach, Colonel Breitenbach later on at that stage, Captain Breitenbach and people by the names of Trevor Floyd, um, I don't want to be in, incorrect, but I, I know Trevor was, he passed away some years ago, rest in peace, was involved. And um, the military commanders actually saw what the worth of Colonel Breitenbach was in, in what he executed in a, in a foreign country. And um, the operational successes, um, you know, I think got their minds going to say, you know, we should establish something of a formal unit which we can use to, to, to execute certain uh, operations. Now, um, what is a special force? Um, in, 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 in the time and, and, and era we are on in, they talk internationally about specialized forces. Now, in, in big countries like America, um, the UK, um, France and, and some of the, in Russia, the Eastern Bloc and so on. They, they refer to specialized forces. Now, specialized forces can, can be anything. You know, it's anything that executes a special operation that is not normally part of your, um, your, your, your I don't want to call it common, but your, let, let's say the normal brigades, like the infantry, um, the engineers, the artillery, and so on. So it, it's anything where there's a, a bit of a combination and a more specialized um, viewpoint towards that they, cause, they call a specialized force. But any country in the world has a special forces, which they see as their pinnacle and their, um, their, their number one unit, the go-to unit, to actually execute strategic operations. And that's where I want to start. So um, the, the, the special forces in South Africa, and I believe in any country in the world, is there to execute and to extrapolate um, your power into any part of the world. May it be internally within your country's borders, or externally. So it's a projection of power. What do you need to project power? Now, I'm not talking about nuclear and um, strategic weapons and stuff like that. I'm talking about the specialized force. Is that you have specially selected people that is psychologically selected to withstand um, pressures, psychological pressures, of a very high grade, and then people that is tested to, to the limit to actually understand the physical capability of an individual. So all special forces have their different um, standards and norms to which they select uh, a special forces. And then they have the, let's say the correct profile person psychologically and physically to start as a building block for training. So once you have a person that is selected and cleared um, with those capabilities, you have to train him. 
to train to execute the type of operation you want to do and want to utilize your special forces for um, nationally and internationally. So that's where you start. And then obviously the different countries determine um, within the, the, the sphere of operations they're going to operate in, what type of um, um, training the person should actually have. So, and I think the South African Special Forces uh, very much models their training cycle and building blocks on the British SAS. Um, we've had a few South African Special Forces guys that uh, when they quit it in South Africa, joined the SAS and passed the, the, the SAS selection and, and carried on as SAS operators. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that went to the American SEALs, but um, I do know that at this stage after the uh, 94 era, that some of our operators actually um, participated in joint um, training or, or mutual training exercises with the SEALs and came out um, top of the class. Um, obviously, um, there was, you know, some things we, we, we lacked in where they were superior, but overall, our people came out very, very well. Okay, so um, that's just to put special forces into to, to context uh, to us. Now I can elaborate a lot more on that, but I don't think for the for for the purpose of, of, of our conversation now, I'm not gonna elaborate on that anymore. Um, of course when when I joined special forces I knew nothing about what I have just said. To me it was um, 32 battalion was just an, an adventure. And, um, you know, I thought, okay, the wreckage would just be a bigger adventure or, you know, you would get some other exposure that would, um, you know, just enlighten life. So um, remember now, I was a student that wanted to become a lawyer. So I'm off on this path of adventure now. But, you know, back in my mind, I always, um, I don't want to say I, I, I feel that I, Yes, I want to say, I have to complete what I started. So that was always in the back of my mind. And but when I, you know, joined Special Forces, you had to, I was then in my second year of my short term service. So um, they told me when I joined Special Forces that, okay, you've got a, a year left in your short term service. That's not long enough. You know, we're going to train you for a year, then your service is over. So you have to consider joining permanent force. So, um, was, yeah, I'm just going to leave that for the moment and, and, and said what happened to me after 32 Battalion. After 32 Battalion, I flew back to South Africa, cleared out in 32, arrived in Pretoria, and I had to, to report to Special Forces HQ. At that stage, Special Forces HQ, the Rekis, was in the Zanza building in Pretoria, Maine. I can't remember the street, but it was there in the, close to the High Court of, at, at present. So Special Forces officers was there. I reported there, and I was introduced to the officer commanding Special Forces, which is General Lutz. Um, what a brilliant person. He also passed away some years ago, but introduced to him and he had been briefed that, you know, I was the only person that made the selection of that um, specific selection course. He welcomed me and I met other uh, General Engelbrecht and, and a few other people in, in Zanza building. So, um, obviously, I had to, to, to report to one Reiki in Durban. Um, one Reiki at that stage, reconnaissance commando those days, was um, the training institute where all training took place, place and they were an operational unit. So all training sorted under one Reiki as well as operational matters. 
Um, at that stage, my life possessions um, consisted of a, a Volkswagen Golf White, I think a 1.1 white Golf, and um, that was it. And I had Browns, and that's what I had. So I reported to, to, to one Ricky, and interesting, you know, I just want to say, when I spoke to General Lewis, you know, I said to him, I'd studied law before and I would like to complete a, 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 a tertiary, you know, qualification at the stage. And would it be possible before I, um, you, you know, really join PF? And he said, it's possible. You know, the military academy is there. Um, you can't study law per se there, but there's a choice of, of other um, B degrees you can achieve. Uh, and he gives me the assurance that they will open that door for me um, and, and, and do that. So that was, that was it. Back to, to Durban. Drove to Durban with my Volkswagen Golf white one. And, you know, you arrive at the bluff and there's these, you know, it's all fenced with double fences and, and, and whatever. You, know, you, you get that feeling of the Second World War Auschwitz camps type of thing, you know. And all wires and so on. The, the boom, you know, people at the boom asked me who I was and, and, you know, what I was doing there. And I said, I'm reporting for service. They said, yeah, but, you know, you're not part of a selection group. I said, yes, no, I'm not part of a selection group, but here I am. So, you know, driving to the HQ, it's all bush and so on. And I thought, you know, this thing went back in my mind, that surprise ambush we had at 32 Battalion, you know. Are these guys planning the same thing, you know? Do they really know I'm coming and, you know, are they going to spring or, you know, jump an ambush on me or whatever? So I was very attentive driving into the HQ of, of, of one recce. Um, of course, I arrived at the, at the duty room, introduced myself, and they took me... To, to the adjutant's office. Reported at the adjutant's office, um, and he said, wait, wait for a while, and he went to the officer commanding's office, um, Colonel Jake Swart, J.C. Swart. Um, now, I'd met JC, Colonel J.C. Swart in Dopis, where I finished my selection. You know, when, when I was, you know, finished with that, um, he actually was in Doppies and he came to me and he, you know, congratulated me. So I knew, not knew, but I knew of um, uh, Colonel Jake Swart. Um, maybe just something about Colonel Jake Swart, uh, a big, strong guy. He played, and I'm under correction now, either lock or flank um, for the free state. And he was a very, very good rugby player. In fact, he captained the, the, the Free State side in, and uh, once again under correction. But um, a good thing I want to tell you, the time he came, captained the, the, the Free State team, the British Lions also toured South Africa. So the British Lions played against the, the Free State team. And the Free State team was ahead until the virtually the last minutes of the game. And um, I think they converted a, a, a penalty and they won. But, um, you know, that is Jake Swart. And, uh, you know, throughout my career in, in Special Forces and thereafter, um, Colonel Jake Swart, later on Brigadier General uh, Jake Swart, was, was such a beautiful person and um, another leader. Um, of course, yeah, uh, cleared in. He, he said to me, I, I went to him once again, you know, hello, welcome, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he said to me, we've got a bit of a problem with you. So uh, <laughs> he said, you, you know, you're the only guy that passed the selection. And, um, you know, you're not into a, a selection group that's going through the training phases of actually, you know, qualifying at the end of the day. So what to do with you? Um, so he dealt me, I was dealt into 
alpha group. There was two groups, alpha and bravo group. And I was dealt into alpha group. Alpha group commander was, um, um, I think he was a captain at that stage, uh, Corey Merrills, also a legend, um, also passed away. But um, then Corey arrived there. So um, Corey was also involved in the minor tactics I did with special forces. So we, I actually deployed under Corey in an operation with special forces, but as a member of 32 battalion. So he also knew, you know, me and um, he was satisfied with, with my performance on, on the minor tactics and the operation thereafter. So he said, it's no problem. You know, they'll see to it whenever there's a, a, a course which the other selection groups are doing, they'll send me and I'll just fall in and fit in and, and so that I can go through the whole process of, of, of qualifying. And that's exactly what happened, course. But what they also did is, and um, they told me that, that, they, that they feel comfortable um, utilizing me operationally. So be, because I have been in 32 Battalion Reiki Group, the Reiki, the, the true Reikis, Andre Diedrichs and them trained the Reikis. I did um, minor tactics with the Reikis. I have deployed with them. So they actually deployed me onto operations um, whilst I was still busy doing all the courses. But eventually I did all the courses. So I didn't skip one. And, um, you know, I eventually... Uh, reach the great or, or reach the stage where I, I truly and fully could could um, deserve my operator's badge. Now at that stage there was no operator's badge, but um, that's a story for later. In any case, um, so of course um, I I was involved with with some minor operations with one Reiki during that time. And I completed my, my series of, of training. I would like to reflect on one of the courses on my training cycle, and that is a bushcraft tracking and survival. Now, I think everybody has, has known um, or, or have heard about Terry the Lion. Now, um, Terry the Lion, I'm just going to also tell the story quickly. When, when we arrived to do bushcraft tracking and survival at Dopis in the Caprivi, there was two lines. It was uh, Lisa, it was a female line, and Terry. And at the place where the instructors planned for us to build the, um, the, the, the bushcraft tracking and survival temporary base, the wild... Um, Karl Faber and uh, Sergeant Major Deval de Beer actually took the young lions with them and, you know, walked with them and, and so on. But the wild lions came in and actually bit off the back at the cross um, of, of Lisa. So Lisa was actually paralyzed and they had to shoot Lisa. So um, Kai Faber, Karl Faber shot Lisa and it was actually tragic, but um, Terry stayed in the camp. So we arrived there and you are dealt up in buddy pairs and then, um, you know, the, the course starts. Now, one of the first things you have to do is to build a, a, a bibby. A bibby is a, is a structure where you can live in that can take all the elements or keep out rain and you can protect your kit and equipment in such a way that it's defendable and so on. And for one other reason, Terry took a liking in me. So whenever, you, it went with everybody, but every night was, Terry would come to the place where I built my bibby. And now you, you, you know, you chop grass in the, in, and, you know, you stack it and, you know, you build your structure and so on. And he used to lie on his back on the cool grass in the shade. And, um, you know, really bump over some of the poles and so on. And when I started building my roof, attaching my roof, he would lie on his back. And there were some twigs hanging out of the, the roof. And then he used to start playing with a with, with the grass sprouts that's hanging out. And after a while, you can imagine, you know, if the one sprout comes out, another one comes out, and 
and it was just a ball and he would stuff up my bib. And the instructors would come by and, you know, they check progress and, and so on. They said, Furi, you are falling behind on a schedule where your bibby has to be finished. You know, you better pull your finger and so on. And I said, yes, uh, uh, we will make it. And uh, it's also a story to my detriment, but I failed bibby building on my survival course. Why? Due to our friend Terry. Terry never allowed me to complete my bibby and, you know, he just stuffed it up day after day. <laughs> but it was, it was so great. In any case, that was it. Um, it was good. Um, yeah. One of the first operations we did after I completed uh, a course um, was uh, from between Onjiva and Ivale in, in, in southern Angola. There was a lot of... Um, logistical movement going to and fro for, um, you know, the, the conventional forces of FAPLA and SWAPA, uh, uh, supporting SWAPA. So um, we were tasked to take a team of 12 people. There was actually three units that was identified to lay ambushes on that road. In the south, it was Willem Ratte with a 3-2 battalion recce group. Then just a bit higher up, it was Colonel Jan Breitenbach. And at that stage, I think he was the commander of 44 para brigade, and he had some sabers. So they did that. And the, the, the group in the, the furthest north was us, the Rekis. And we were trooped in uh, by, by Chopper, by Puma Oryx helicopters. And we were dropped. And our plan was. There was mechanized brigades, so drop that last light. Then we would, would put a tank, anti-tank mine on the road and lay an ambush. So, you know, at night, they, 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 they barely ever really see the, the, the landmine. They just drive over it and, and it detonates and, you know, you, you do whatever you have to do. So we were just offloaded. We set out our, our ambush positions pretty much as happened in 32 Battalion when I was still putting out, um, you know, arcs of fire and so on. But um, I, was a, I was the blue guy, you know, the, 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 the youngest, not, the, not physically the youngest, but, um, you know, the, the, the groenkie in the group. But I was the commander. So um, we laid the ambush, and uh, one of my friends, uh, long-time friends, Franz van Dijk, um, and then um, Keros, also a, a very interesting character. Um, one of the stopper groups reported they can hear a vehicle. In any case, um, everybody was ready, looking through the night vision goggles. We saw the glare coming on. And, you know, we asked the guys, are you dug in? Is it ready? Can we take him on? Or shall we wait for the, for the next gun? And the guys agreed. Let's start. It's nice and early. We can eat a lot of people. Or, you know, we can, we can, we can really work tonight. In any case, uh, so everybody was ready and in. And the guys said, okay, it's a single vehicle. They can hear it's a single vehicle. And um, Kerosh was the RPG gunner. And Franz was, I think he was my second in command. And the three of us, us were standing in the tar road. So now we were awaiting this vehicle. In any case, the vehicle came and um, Kerosh was ready to shoot it. So we took the mine out of the road and we, was, we said, the single vehicle will take on frontal with the RPG, shoot it out and, you know, carry on. So, so said and so done. So uh, Franz still, you know, calmed down Kerosh. He said, wait, wait, wait. And I think the, the vehicle was about 200 meters from us. He said, fire. So now this vehicle is coming on at the speed of, let's say, 80 kilometers an hour towards us. And um, the rocket is flying at a, a bigger rate, obviously. So... The RPG hit the cab in the middle, and obviously the slug went through, 
and detonated the fuel. Now it was a big fuel tanker and everything exploded. Um, and this vehicle veered off the road into our ambush positions. So, you know, that was a bit of chaos and lessons very, very well learned. You know, <laughs> you know planning in a different way if you take a, on a vehicle head on that it um, isn't in such a position that it can actually drive over your own uh, positions. But luckily, um, nobody was injured, but, you know, it was a big ball of fire. Um, the, the, the packs that was in the lorry was, you know, running around all ablaze, crazy, screaming, oh my, oh my, and shot them. And, um, yeah, there it was burning. So, uh, the truck actually stopped on the position where our HF system was. So our HF radio burned out and some of the equipment, I think it was Yapi Klokkers, um, in his position and um, that was it. So we decided, okay, let it burn and we moved up the road from where we knew the next convoy or whoever was going to react to, to what has happened here to ambush them. We were in place and not long after that, we had the vehicles come. Um, it happened to be BRDMs, BTRs, um, mounted with uh, 23 mils and 14 fives, and it was a huge convoy. Now, of course, we were two, three meters from the road because it was fairly dense bush and um, they stopped. Now, do you take them on or not? And we worked out, okay, the elevation of their barrels, you know, the heavy weapons wouldn't bend down far enough to actually be able to, to, to shoot us. And, and the guys around me said, sir, <laughs> we're not going to take them on now. They are too many. You know, even if they just form an extended line and, and sweat into the bush, um, you know, we will be overpowered. So, you know, we decided, okay, we'll, we'll not do that. And we slowly started moving back into the bush. And they might have picked it up and then all hell broke loose. And they started firing into the bush. And, um, you know, they didn't want to form a sweep line length then. But some of the BTRs and BRDM started driving into the bush and the chase was on. So um, we uh, ran away to fight another day. And, um, you know, they, we really had to do a lot of dog legs because there were some of their guys with torches and, and, you know, going on our tracks. And so we made dog legs the whole time, you know, dog legs, dog legs. So that, and, and they had, the mechanized people actually got, I think, a bit confused. You know, they couldn't turn the whole time and, and they got the car in the bush. And um, at the stage, we actually went back and crossed the tracks where they went on. So, you know, we actually took them in a circle and, and so on. But um, that, was, that was actually one of the first real contact and big, uh, it wasn't big, but, um, you know, interesting thing uh, where I participated in, in, in um, after I, I, I joined the group. Um, of course, that's also the night, probably I, I got the coldest in my whole life in the bush. Because we went in very light with um, very few warm stuff because we were going to fight the whole night. But, um, you know, running away, you sweat a lot and then you sit down to rest and um, that sweat cools down and it was, it was interesting. Also learned a few lessons there about that. Um, we had emergency RFEs. So if you did not contact by HF, you know, the, the whole emergency escape and evasion plan kicks in and it worked out like a dream. And we were picked up by the choppers the, the, the following morning. Um, was then in, in July of 81, there was a command, or, or before that, there was a command change at one recce where... Um, Colonel Andre Besbier, also a big rugby player. Uh, I think he, he also he also played for the Free State, and at the stage he, he, he jogged out for the Springboks as well on hooker. 
became the um, OC of one Reggae. Then in June, July of 81, um, they called in a few guys and they said we were going to have um, training in Israel. Um, it was just after the uh, Munich Games in, in Germany, where I think it was the Bader Meinhof gang attacked the, uh, the athletes of the Israelis in the Olympic village. And special forces also decided, yeah, in that same time, there was two incidents in South Africa, one in Johannesburg where um, the terrorists also occupied a building. And I think Roy Riss is a, is a, is a policeman. He sorted out the, the situation. And then there, there was a APSA, uh, APSA, a Volkskast Bank, which later became APSA. Volkskast Bank in Silverton, where some um, terrorists went or adversaries went in and they um, took the people hostage and robbed the bank. And I can't remember exactly if there was people killed, but then um, the, the police task force actually sorted out that problem. And the, the, the two people that, that played a, a significant role in that was, I think at that stage, Captain Tini Stridom. And I think it was a Sergeant Mike Fryer. So, you know, they sorted out that. And I think the, the top structure and the command of the SANDF and uh, the police realized that, you know, uh, it was time that the South African military um, built up a capability that can actually deal with um, terror incidents in the country. So it was decided um, South Africa and Israel worked um, together very, very well at that stage. So um, it was decided that four guys from one recce would, 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 would participate, and then two people from the special task force would participate and go to Israel and do the um, anti-terror course there. Now, it was a major... He was a captain at that stage, Davi Fouri. It was myself, Lieutenant Franz Fouri. Um, I think it, at that stage, it was Staff Sergeant James Teitge. And um, uh, he was a Sergeant Roy Vermaak. That was the four guys from, from Special Forces that was nominated to go and do that course. And then um, Tini and uh, Mike Fryer from the the special task force of the police. So we went over to Israel and the, 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 uh, the training was done with a um, special border police. Now at that stage, the special border police, I think was responsible for dealing with um, anti-terror cases within the country, internally, because um, with command and control and jurisdiction where you can deploy and employ forces, it becomes important. You know, internally it's done by the police and externally you can do it with your special forces. Hence, some special forces and police guys that went to do the training. So our um, mission and aim was to do the course, learn maximum, and then come back with the doctrines and the uh, curricula and, you know, everything they did and then start our own um, training capability to train our own people in anti-terror operations. So that was very interesting. Um, the Israelis really knew what they were doing and uh, we had very, very good training and uh, a ball of a time in, in, in Israel. They really looked after us very well. We performed well. And we learned a few very interesting things there. One of those was that um, the South Africans was far superior in um, stamina and body strength in terms of running, walking, uh, carrying heavy equipment. But the Israelis were far superior in upper body strength. In other words, you know, pulling yourself up, climbing onto walls and buildings and, you know, that type of thing. So we would outperform them by far in, in certain categories, and they would outperform us 
by far in, in, in the upper body strength stuff, which was a good, very good thing to learn. So we could um, restructure our physical training programs to actually put more emphasis on developing the upper body strength and, and you know, everything that, that went with that. Uh, and in turn, they um, got some information from us how to develop their, their stamina and, and the other parts of that. Um, of course, two things, which is uh, maybe a bit comical, I want to relate to, to this. After the course, um, it was a big thing, you know, the, the ambassador and the military attaché to Israel, you know, there was a big do at the, at the ambassador's house. Now it, and some generals, and I can't remember if it was General Falun or, you know, there was heavy brass from South Africa also there to, to participate in, in, in this festival. And um, in any case, this ambassador had a, a daughter and a son. They were, you know, quite younger than us, but, but with their mother, and the, the um, servants they had, they were tasked to, you know, carry around the, the snacks. And, you know, if, a, if some of the snacks got low, you know, they had to fill the board, the, the, the plates and, and so on. But they had a dog as well. And there was a, a bag of epaul standing there. Now, you know, the Israelis have all funny, you know, things they... they, they, they they make with hummus and I don't know what they call it. But some of these stuff looked like Ipo. And I said to my colleagues, and I said to them, tonight is the night that I am feeding generals Ipo. And um, in some of the bowls, I actually put some Ipo. And I personally carried this tray around and, you know, so would you like <laughs> blah blah blah? And only behold was believe me today. And I can't remember exactly who it was, but you know, they took took a few of this and you know, and they, they ate it. And at this stage, one actually called me back and he said, Franz, isn't there some of those stuff left? So I had to go back to the kitchen to go and fetch more people. So that night I fed the generals and the top brass people. <laughs> Which is both. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, um, you, you know, and, and the, the daughter and the son of the ambassador, you know, they said, no, you're going to get killed. You can't do that. You know, if they find out there's going to be big trouble. It never came out, but I'm telling it now. And the colleagues that was on the course with me can testify to that. The other thing was, we, we received, we received um, extra allowances for, you know, being abroad and for accommodation and what, what, what. And we actually saved up a lot of money. We, we booked out of the five-star five hotel and we went and stayed in a one-star hotel, which was better and, and, and so on. We saved a lot of money. But when we left Israel, I bought a, um, just under a carrot um, size diamond because the people said in diamond, you know, if you're in Israel, buy a diamond, you know, if you can, it's a good investment, blah, 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 blah. And um, going out, I actually bought this blue white diamond and, you know, of a, of a fair size. And, you know, they put it in a little leather bag and into my pocket and, and, and we went off. Now, this diamond was. My friends in special forces, and especially by the name of Biesje Greiling, Chris Greiling. Now, Chris and the people that know Chris listen to this. Now, Chris would date girls, and then he would come to me and he would say, Franz, can I borrow your diamond for the night, please? <laughs> then I don't know what he did, but he borrowed my diamond for the night and or for a week or two, and uh, I don't know what promises or whatever he did to the ladies and to why and what he would achieve, but in any case, a few guys borrowed that diamond from me over the time. And as it may be, 
today that diamond is on the finger of my wife. So when I got in, engaged in, in later years, I used that uh, diamond and yeah, so it, it, it was used for, for a good purpose. Um, of course, then maybe just a few other operations that, that took place. Um, the Liba Pass is between Namib and um, Lubango. Now, Namib is the southern big port in Angola, which was a very, very important um, port where a lot of uh, logistics was offloaded for the war effort um, and then went by train um, up to the plateau and then distributed to the war zone. And then the Liba Pass itself is a, is a pass with a lot of uh, turns and so on, a beautiful place. And uh, we were tasked to um, disrupt the logistical line from um, Namibia to Lubongo. And uh, the, the, the person in, they put in command was Corey Merrills. I think at that stage he was a major and there were three teams. Um, I can remember Don von Sale was the team that had to, um, with uh, explosive, identify certain places on the on the pass to actually blow and cascade some of the, the mountain onto the road and knock off some of the, the, the bridges and so on, so that the pass was, was neutralized. The other group, and it slipped my mind, I can't remember uh, who the team leader was, but their task was to shoot down any aircraft in that area. So we had a, a quite a lot of uh, SAM-7 missiles, and that was that team's task. My task was to disrupt and blow up the railway line. Um, so the, the, we flew out of Ondangwa. Now from Ondangwa to um, where we planned our temporary base was about 430 kilometers. Uh, one way. So both the choppers we flew in had big ferry tanks in and was, you know, we, the, the, the weight calculations was very, very important. For the choppers to actually be able to take off and, um, you know, carry enough fuel to come back and, and so on. So it was a, a very carefully planned um, logistical effort to get everything there. Now I can remember the choppers, we, we operated out of uh, Fort Foot in Ondangwa, and uh, we had a few forts, operational, uh, we called it forts. So the, the one in Indong, Ondangwa was called Fort Foot. So, you know, the choppers parked on the runway outside of, of Fort Foot, loaded them up, and then there's still about two, three hundred meters left until the end of the, the runway. So these two choppers, didn't do a vertical takeoff. Now, the, the, the pilots, they actually test the weight by, you know, firing everything up and then they, you know, pull maximum power and they see if they can lift. And, and I know both the choppers just lift. But in any case, so they didn't do a vertical takeoff. They actually did a running takeoff. So, you know, they run and then they, they take off. And of course, we just just made the, the fences on the other side. So the choppers were really, you know, loaded to capacity, but the pilots performed very well. Um, I also had the privilege of sitting in the tech seat between the two pilots, um, also assisting with navigation uh, as we went along. So in our in-flight there, we were going at treetop level all the way. So literally, you know, the, just at three top level to avoid the radar and detection and so on. And then when you reach Lubongo, the Liba Mountains actually drops, I think it's 1,862 meters above sea level. But if you are down at the plateau, 
there's not much drop towards uh, Namib. So I would reckon the, 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 the cliffs and the, the, you know, the sheer drop when you come over the, um, the plateau is about 1,200 meters. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge drop. I might be wrong by a few meters or so, but that's of academical value. Any case, so, you know, we were flying and it was just before uh, last light. And, you know, all of a sudden, if you fly a treetop level and, you, you know, you're looking at the trees and so on, and the next moment, there's nothing under you, you know, <laughs> due to the sheer drop. And the co-pilot was, I think, a Lieutenant Dutton. I think he was the son of Mike or, or General Dutton. Um, but, uh, you know, also a good pilot. But in any case, as, as we went over this cliff and, and dropped down, he actually looked out of the, you know, looking wherever he was looking, and he, and he said, look at the irrigation scheme down there. So, you know, we all looked, and it really looked like an irrigation scheme. But it wasn't the irrigation scheme. It was traces being fired in our direction with, probably 23 miles and, and 14 to fives or whatever. Now, obviously, the guys took evasive action and eventually came to the place where, where they dropped us off. Um, dropped us off. We went into a round defense position and, you know, all kit and equipment was loaded off and the choppers departed. Now, we knew we were kind of compromised. You know, if, if they were shooting in our direction to the helicopters, we were compromised. So it would be a matter of time before, you know, we dip into, a, um, you know, the back area of, of, of the enemy. Um, first night, nothing happened. Um, second or the, the second day, the first day, we, um, you know, established very good caches and hid all the equipment away. And um, then we planned whatever we would do. So... The next morning, I would um, depart to go and uh, derail the, the trains and uh, mine and blow up some culverts and minor bridges on the railroad track. So the distance we had to walk from our TV to the, um, to the railroad was approximately, depending on you know, the, the angle you took onto the railroad line, anything between 27 and, and 35 kilometers. So we were walking towards, everything went well. It was a six-man team. Yes, six-man team. And um, at about three o'clock, could have been earlier, uh, we knew we were close to the railway line and we said, okay, we'll, we'll take a break. Did a very, very good dog leg. And um, there was an area where there was a big, big, big flat rock with a rocky out, outcrop and a little ravine running next to that. So we took the dog leg and went onto the rock, walked on the rock so that there's no tracks and they couldn't track you. But it obviously led them onto, if they were going to follow us, would take them onto this open rock. And we went into this ravine and uh, that's where we we laid up until it was such a time that we could infiltrate towards the railway line and do a reconnaissance at night as to where we would put the, the devices on the railway line and mine. And obviously we took the, the time to, to have a lunch or, you know, a break. And according to tactics, you, you know, in, in the body pairs you are, you, um, the one is a sentry and the other one eats. So um, myself and Franz van Dijk was, was body pairs again, and Franz um, could eat first. And um, at this stage, now this is not more than 10 meters, uh, you know, away from us on this open rock, a patrol of about 15 people appeared. So everybody was alert, but um, Franz was, was eating. And I saw the, the, the scout, the front scout, you know, he stopped and he started looking around. 
And I think he spotted France with his, you know, little tin that was camouflaged, but um, the movement probably, you know, attracted his attention and caught his eye. But I was aiming at him from my position on the head. And as, as this guy realized, okay, that's where they are hiding. He had his AK slung over his, his shoulder. And as he picked it up, I pulled the trigger and dropped the guy between the eyes. A very, very good shot. You can't get better, I must say myself. And so <laughs> Klopp is, uh, rest in peace, he's dead, but a lot of other people can testify. Okay, and then as per normal contacts, all hell broke loose. You know, the 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 the... The Tars were totally confused. You know, they didn't know in what direction to shoot. And uh, all our people opened up and, and you know, they soon, soon fled and, and went into a direction. Um, we picked up a lot of blood spoor. Um, so obviously certain people, you know, wounded seriously. But the only person we found was, you know, in the Dwitzacker was, was this guy shot the between the eyes. So I ordered, you know, to sweep the, the, the area to see where they were and if they were out of, of, of our area. And at the stage when I looked back, there was Kloppis. Now Kloppis wasn't in our sweeping line. And what was Kloppis doing? He was going through this, this guy that was dropped there, you know, taking off the watch and taking off this and going through the pockets and so on. So I ordered Kloppis back into the line and um, we swept the area, came back, and, you know, I obviously reported that to Corey, and Corey said, okay. They've also encountered uh, uh, um, some patrol scouting in their area. We had this contact withdrawal. So um, now we had all these explosives and, you know, mines with us and so on. And at this stage, um, we picked it up that the guys were um, obviously following us. So to shake them off, we used the landmines uh, linked to APs and, and some devices which we would use on the, on the railway line to actually slow down the advance of, of the people that were pursuing us, which worked very well because, you know, we, we, we would be going and you would hear the explosions going off. So that made them very, very careful to actually, uh, you know, advance quicker onto, onto us. Now, a lot of people will tell you as well, as I've said, Corey Meerholz is a, is a great, great guy, um, a, a very brave soldier. He received a wound at the, at the Eki and was also awarded the Honoris Crux at the, at, at the Eki. Um, but there's one thing that, that Corey um, lacked. Now, everybody will tell you that, and it's actually a joke. Corey wasn't good with navigation. You know, good. So he always had somebody navigating for him. But so we arranged an RV. The other teams now, you had, we had to be picked up in two groups. The two other teams grouped and they had an RV. I had to RV with Corey and then the choppers would pick us up and, and take us out. So I said to Corey, okay, I'll, um, you know, we're in this area, where are you? And he gave a, a Romeo Victor, and I said, you know, plotted another area and said, okay, this looks like a good and a safe area to be picked up, and he agreed. And he said, okay, you'll wait for me there. So we arrived at this RV, but Corey wasn't there. So I said to Corey, Corey, uh, you know, according to me, we're at the position. He said, no. I'm at the position, you're not at your position. But we also gave this RV through to the choppers for them to know where to pick us up. So when the choppers came in, they came right to my position and they picked us up, which was obviously the right position. <laughs> so it was a bit of a laugh. And, uh, you know, and everybody laughed. And even Corey, you know, he, he pushed himself and said, yes, yes, okay, just don't go on about my ballet and my navigational skills, because he was a ballet dancer at school, but he became a reiki and a very good reiki. In any case, 
So uh, we were picked up and, and evacuated. They could talk us in very easily. You know, when, when you know where the choppers are and they're flying in a direction, you know, you say, turn, turn left, um, okay, turn, roll out, straight ahead, and we picked them up very, very quickly. So, of course, yeah, that was another um, good operation. It was unsuccessful. I think we could have achieved a lot, but um, unfortunately, it was compromised, and I think the best we could do was, was one confirmed kill. Um, of course, then, um, the Matola raid, Operation Beanbag. Operation Beanbag was... Um, was planned to take out the, the command structure of the ANC at that stage, who was the adversaries, and um, it would be done by six recce. Now, there's, um, I didn't in, in, in my introduction to, to the recce group or to the special forces explain to you our organizational structure, and maybe I must take a, a minute just to do that. We had the HQ which shifted from Zanza building to a specifically built, purposely built structure at um, Swartkop Park. Um, and that was the HQ. So the HQ sat there with all the intelligence services, all the support services. Then we had one recce in the bluff at Durban, which conducted all the training and was a operational unit as well. In the early days, Five Reiki was at Matuba Tuba or uh, St. Lucia in, in, in Natal. And they uh, later on shifted and moved to Palaborva, where they are up until today. And then um, C Group, Charlie Group, became four Reiki. So um, they built a base in um, Langeban in the West Coast, close to Saldana. There was an old whaling station on the island, so to speak, on the peninsula. And um, that old whaling station was taken over with some of their facilities. And that was Foreki. Foreki was the um, seaward unit of um, special forces. And you could uh, make a direct comparison as to the SBS, the special boat services of, of the UK. So they have the SAS which I would reckon is a, a one recce, and then the SBS, which would be a, a four recce. Then we had a logistical supply unit at the Valmans Tal, where all our um, logistics was done. And then we had a, a special branch, um, which was um, EMLC. Now, I can't exactly remember what the, uh, the abbreviation stands for, but EMLC was commanded by Colonel um, Seibrand van der Spey. Coincidentally, he has two sons, um, young Seibi and Ola. They both became operators. So it was father and the two sons operators. And they all perform, performed excellently. Ola is still one of the orthopedic surgeons I see regularly at that one military hospital. And Seibi at the stage was my second in command at, um, at one recce. Um, but in any case, that was EMLC, and they built all the funnies for special forces. So anything that was designed, what we required, they made that. Um, who did I leave out? Oh, two recce. Two recce uh, was the citizen force recce. And um, Saibi, Colonel van der Spey, he was also the, the commander of two recce. So two recce was all the citizen force guys. You know, if you were in one of the commanders and you went out and became a doctor or a a lawyer or a whatever, um, you did your camps with two reiki. And then when the Zimbabwe war stopped, the, the SAS and the Sulu scouts came down to South Africa. Some guys opted to go directly into one or four or five reiki, but um, a, a, a unique or a, a a, a, a lone standing unit, which was six, six recce, was formed for them with their own command structure and their leaders and so on. So that was basically the, the organizational structure of, of Special Forces at that stage. Now, back to Beanbag. Beanbag 
was allocated to six reiki and they would um, execute the, the, the offensive phase of that with elements of one reiki and five reiki um, allocated to, to them, excuse me. Um, then, of course, the, 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 the root reiki had to be done. They planned an infiltration route where they could go with the vehicles. And then on the road, there were certain um, stopper groups or um, sentry posts and so on. And I was tasked, uh, tasked as a small team to actually um, check the route, if it was feasible, if, if vehicles could you know, pass there physically on the ground, and then check out all the... Um, the, the, the whatever deployments they had on the route up until a certain space. So that was done in a, in a two-man team, myself and Kerosh. Now, uh, ARMG, that's his initials, Staff Sergeant Kerosh, he's a tall fellow, uh, impressive guy, <laughs> really a good guy. And um, the two of us had to conduct this. Now, from the Rosano Garcia border post between South Africa and uh, Mozambique up onto the, the hills, they would switch off the electrified fence for um, 30 minutes um, just before last light. And we had to scale the fence, which was about, I think, 2.2 meters high with electrical wires and so on. Now, the kit we carried wasn't heavy. It was about 45 k's kgs and and you know not a big deal so i would climb over first and kerosh was you know doing his scouting so i climbed up next to one of the you know big poles on the wire and when i was at the top and i swung over my one leg obviously there's a lot of weight going down on your other leg, which is still on the wire. And as I did this, this wire slipped down on the pole. And I fell. Not, yeah, you know, I lost my balance and there I was hanging upside down on the fence between, you know, <laughs> the border fence. And with a pack on my back and, and everything, you know, I just couldn't manage to, you know, get up and, you know, free myself and get myself down. And we had little tactical radios with us. We called it a tap B. Um, if you worked in, in, in a small team, a, a two-man team. So, you know, I, I tried for about five minutes to, to free myself. And then I decided maybe I must call in Kerosh to, to assist. So, so I called Kerosh. I'm having a problem to free myself. Can you assist me, please? So Kerosh was lying there and he was laughing. He said, ah, you think, I think I was a captain. He says, captain, can you think I cannot see how you are struggling? He said, and yes, I can help you, but do you think I want to help you? <laughs> so Kerosh, now I'm listening to this and I know he's pulling my leg, but you know, this is the conversation going on. Now you can think how I feel hanging there, totally exposed, upside down on this fence. So Kero said to me, he said, sir, I think you can hang for another two minutes or so, just to give you back for all the shit you've given me in my life before. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, up until today, we are very, very big friends. And, and Kerosh is a, a wonderful guy. Long story short, he helped me. We both scaled the fence. We executed the, the, the operation, uh, reconnoitred the, the route. Um, the, the enemy positions along the way, which was totally, you know, just a, there were some guys, but, you know, you could just as well put down a, I don't know what they, you know, they meant nothing. So they never posed a threat to the, the force that went in. And I'm not going to, to, to um, speak about the actual raid. But uh, on the day of the raid, uh, we were actually on the, the road. And uh, to see that nobody, you know, 
to, to act as stopper groups if, if anybody would um, try to uh, in, uh, interfere. Uh, we climbed up the, the poles and cut the telephone wires and stuff like that, but um, no big deal. But um, the Matola raid went off well. I think there were some guys lost there. And I know Rick Standard, one of the Rhodesian guys, also received the Norris groups for, for his actions on, on that. Um, of course, then um, Operation Kerslich, um was had to be executed. Um, now we didn't. Uh, the The commander of the group would be Do State. Now Do knew what was going on, and then we were four teams, five teams that would actually. Um, you know, with each one having a target and 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 execute the the operation, but we didn't know what we were going to do and where we were going to do this. But um, of course, I can say that in in my time in one Reiki, that was the time we were probably the fittest I can think of. You know, we really did a lot of physical training. We ran down from the bluff to the naval base, and then we would swim and, you know, do a lot of PT, and we were really very, very physically well prepared. We prepared very well for, um, uh, you know, combat and, and certain stuff, and at this stage, they said, okay, our, our mission would be to blow up a, 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 a oil tank farm and a refinery. So, but not, we didn't know where or, you know, the, the location. So we were taken to several of the um, oil installations in Durban. There's a few refineries or one or two refineries there and a lot of tank farms. So we, we used to run around those tank farms, up the abutments, down, climb up here and climb fences and, and, and so on. So we were extremely, extremely well prepared and ready to execute the task. Then we were shifted to um, Fort Reiki in Langebon. In Langebon on the island, um, you are isolated. You cannot get in contact. No cell phones and stuff like that in those days, but you know, no ticky boxes or whatever. So you couldn't get in contact with anybody. So we were isolated and our final preparation started there. Um, then it was revealed to us where the operation was going to be executed in Luanda. And, um, you know, each team leader went through his target and whatever he had to do. We built real mock-ups with the right distances between the targets. And um, we received the limpet mines we had to put in. We got training on that and how to arm them and disarm them and, and all those stuff. So the preparations and everything was really up to a very high standard. And then at the stage we left, um, we were on board of the SAS. Um, it's their surveying vessel. Um, and also the Tafelberg. And then the, the two strike craft went up and the submarine uh, one of the, the Daphne class submarines went up as well. So um, when we got to the area, um, Sam Fury and Jack Grief actually did the reconnaissance on the landing place where we would land um, the route up, and they did the last final recce on the on the oil installation. Um, there's, it's also a, a, a hair-raising experience what they um, experience there. Um, and maybe I can just, you, you know, the guys came out, the, the Cubans and, and the, the, the FAPLA soldiers, where they actually literally nearly urinated on Sam. Uh, you know, so close. And, and um, really the guys did a brilliant and an excellent job. Uh, they came back, boarded the, the, the uh, SAS Prutia again, and, you know, the final briefings took place. And, um, okay, it was decided that we would uh, move in on the 30th of November, and that was the night the, the, the operation was executed. 
Um, everything went well, um, but uh, the thing I can remember very clearly, we had to go through cassava lands. Now, cassava is a plant they plant, and it's in sand, and they, you know, dig these ditches. So as you approach the refinery, the burn off flame of the, the tower is so, um, so bright that it actually blinded you. So you know, we really battled to walk towards the flame because it, it blinded you. And then there was an outer perimeter fence and an inner perimeter fence. Between the outer perimeter fence and the inner perimeter fence, it was clear like a soccer field or a rugby field. So we had to leopard crawl across, I can't remember, let's say, and I don't want to lie or overinflate, but anything between 150 and let's say 300 meters. Now, Jack Kreef crawled up in front. So if you crawl towards the light, you can't see much because you are blinded. And Jack at the stage looked around to see how the rest of us was coming on. And he said, when he looked around, he froze because we were standing out like pimples on the face of a nice milk <laughs> skin because the light was shining in our direction. But in any case, we uh, there was a few guard posts. We reached the target and the RV point and, and we were ready to disperse. So uh, my targets was the, 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 the jet fuel depot. Um, Cocky the Cox team had to do the big, you know, um, storage tanks. Gert Ekstien and those guys had to do the gas tanks. And I think Jack and them had to do the, the calling tower, the, the distilling tower. So, you know, there we were, split up. Everything went well. Everyone went into their own direction. And then um, as we were, and, and it was all planned, you know, I would mine this tank and, you know, the, my two buddies would, would check where, you know, the environment next tank, I would be a guard. And so we all mined um, the different tanks and all the teams basically had the same sequence. And I think we were busy mining the third tank and then a, a huge explosion occurred. And I could hear that it was in the area where, where Koki and them was. Now, when that happened, um, the, 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 the big tanks caught fire. So, you know, if these big tanks start burning, it's not a bright fire, it's a big fire. And um, very, very, in a very short period after that, some other mines also started going off. And our, our, our drill was that the sirens went off and, you know, if all the emergency stuff that the refinery had kicked in place and, and you know, there was, was, it was chaotic. So we had, if anything went wrong, we would withdraw to, the, to, an, to an RV point, which we all did. And um, the only team, obviously, that, uh, well, not obviously, but I knew it, the incident occurred at, at Koki's place. But um, everybody was there, checked in at the, at the RV point, and um, Koki and them didn't arrive. So obviously, Koki and them was gone, you know, not at the RV point. So I took my team, and, and, and I was tasked in the, in the planning that that would be my, you know, if I wasn't injured, it would be my task to go and look for everybody, anybody that's lost or had a problem. And the two guys I had with me was Nick, Nick Pretorius and Stray Stradom. Brilliant operators and, and really fit and diligent, strong guys. So, of course, we, we knew what the route was in for Koki and them to, to, to do their job. So we tried to, you know, that was the known route to me where they went. So we tried to actually follow that route. But the, the flames and the, the fire was of such a nature that, I mean, you couldn't breathe. You know, it was just too hot and the smoke and, and everything. So on three occasions, I tried to 
to take different routes to actually, you know, get to, to that area, but um, we couldn't succeed. So at, we went back to the RV and um, at this stage, we saw a, a person coming towards us, but we couldn't identify if it was friend or, or, or foe. Um, I had my sights right on him. Jack Grief had his sights right on him and we were standing side by side. Now we had a, a, a code word that if we came into the RV and, and you were challenged, we would say moon to bon, which means very good. And then we knew it was, you know, one of us and, and you could come in. But uh, we soon realized it was actually Yapi Kloppers coming there. He had, didn't have a piece of clothes on his body. He was totally naked, um, only his boots on his feet. And he came in and he was, you know, really badly injured, but mostly burnt you know, burn wounds and, and, and fine shrapnel. He didn't bleed much, but, um, and he said, uh, you know, he, he knows where it happened. He can take us back the way we came in, or he came out now. So once again, uh, me and my team, and then Sam Furi, which was another big buddy of mine, joined us. And Yapik Klopper took us to where the place was. And at this stage, there was a, a lot of big pipes coming in and out. So it was very difficult to, to, to cross and scale them. You couldn't crawl underneath, but to climb over them was really a mission. So I left um, Nick and Strace there with Yapi because Yapi was injured, but Yapi said, just on the other side, look in that area. But the control room and the reaction room from where the soldiers reactors was literally if you get the ditch and then the tanks is there so you get a ditch and it's up and then it's level with the road and all these um, activities took place there so it was literally five ten meters from us but elevated so we started looking around in that area and at this stage i saw someone crawling up this embankment towards the the um, the noise that was going on there and when i went closer it was uh, pit feike pit feike uh, was obviously totally disorientated and he was crawling up this embankment towards where the enemy and and the other people was and that he was not more than three to four meters from them and I realized if, if they saw him and, you know, he would be captured and it would be a problem. So I dashed forward, um, climbed up the hill and got um, Pit Feike out and brought him back to, um, to, to, to Nick and, and, and Strace. And myself and, and Sam said to them, you know, take Pit. So, so Strace and Nick actually started taking um, Pete and Tlopis back to the RV. They couldn't carry them because they, their bodies were so burned that if you touch them, they just held in, in, in pain. So they literally just, you know, tried, they kept their arms and, you know, assisted as, as much as they could, but they couldn't carry them. So we stayed, myself and Sam stayed in that area for as long as we could looking for cookie. But we couldn't find Koki. We found um, pieces of equipment and, and so on, but um, Koki, no. And on several occasions, um, Jack was in control of the, the, the RV, you know, and he called us back because everywhere soldiers were and troops were starting to deploy. And um, he said, we have to go now. We're going to get cut off and, you know, it's going to be chaos and, and so on. And we really stretched it to the, to the maximum quest to try and find Koki, but we couldn't find him. Eventually, we, we went back to the RV, joined the guys, and we went out. The, the strike craft um, actually came in much, much closer to the shoreline that they are 
supposed to do because they knew we had casualties and um, you know it shows the the um, I don't want to call it the audacity, the 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 inborns, the, the the braveness of our, our our sailors as well, you know, to risk their strike craft to come closer to you know to to, to make the distance shorter for the injured people to be um, evacuated. So um, it was great. Um, it was a it was a loss. Couldn't find Cookie, and uh, we were all safe back onto the. Um, to the strike craft and 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 we went out. So um, it was a the operation eventually was actually a success because the sympathetic explosions and the heat of the other tanks, you know, destroyed most of the the, the, the installation. So operationally, in terms of um, achieving the the aim and the goal, it was done. Um, we lost Koki, but um, like the, I think the next day they found a, literally just a shoe and a, a boot and yeah, okay some equipment and some mines that didn't explode, but the foot of Koki was found by them and they actually you know took the foot out and saw it was a white foot. So yeah, that was Operation Kersler. Now in in Koki's kit. He, he had a bottle of um, rum, which he, you know, after the operation, we would, you know, take a tot of rum and, and so on. So I had to, you know, take care of Cocky's kit. And I knew he had a bottle of rum in there. And I took the bottle out and, you know, we, we did with the bottle what, what is supposed to be done. And uh, we went back. So that was a bit of a, a, a sad one, but operationally actually a successful operation. Um, was then the, the, the last operation I want to reflect on and that happened in December 82 um, is Operation Katisu now Operation Katisu um, is the attack on the oil depots in Baira in, uh, on, on the east coast in Mozambique um, Baira was pumping fuel to Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe was pumping fuel to Zambia and to the southern parts of, of Angola. So it was all these operations was um, there with the aim of destroying the logistical feed and the fuel to um, the front where the other forces were fighting the conventional war. Operation was pretty much the same as um, uh, in, in, in Kerslich. My target at the time was the pump station, the pumping station, and the other teams, you know, they had the, 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 the tanks. And um, then what happened there is, you know, landed perfectly, went to the thing, got to the dispersal point, each one went to the, in, in their direction. But we had to climb over a, a wall about two meters high to get into the pumping station. But at the pumping station, the control room was there and also the reaction force of, of the um, refinery. So as we, I went up first to you know check out what was going on. I could see the control room some guards moving around there and, you know, people sitting behind the control. I could clearly see where the pump was, where, where we had to place the, the charges and so on. And there was a roof. So if you climb up this side, there was a, a zinc roof. They built a, a shed. So that, that posed a bit of a problem because we thought we could just climb over the wall, down the other side and, and go in. But that wouldn't happen. You would have to climb over onto the, 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 the zinc and then, um, you, you, you know, go down, which wasn't a, a major problem, but, um, you know, you were exposed for, for longer and it would obviously make a noise. Um, I went down, you know, briefed the guys, okay, we're going to do it. And as we went up, a lot of goats, about 10 goats, came out of the, the shed because they were alerted and geese, goats and geese. 
So they made a hell of a noise, uh, you know, and and the, the, the people in the guard room, the guards and everybody um, was alerted by that. So if you climb over the wall, you are silhouetted. So, you know, they could see us and they saw us. So when they saw us, they hit the bottom and the sirens and everything went off in the in the tank farm. So um, the guards that was there uh, was alerted. Um, and we said, I had to make the decision to say, OK, guys, we scale this wall. We shoot the guys and we attack the pumping station and we get out and we go. But, um, you know, of course, as a as a team leader, then you had I had to make the decision. Are we going to do it or not? And I realized that if we do it, the, the, the possibility or the probability of us picking up um, uh, an injury or even somebody getting killed is high. Um, at that stage, some other vehicles with troops on arrived at the gate and was coming in. So once again, you know, it was, there was too many people. Yes, we could climb over and, you know, try to make a Murphy stand and, and so on. But what if somebody got killed? How to get an injured person or a dead person over the wall, carry him out, and so on? And our infiltration and exfiltration route went past um, anti aircraft positions. So, you know, if they were alerted and a lot of firing started going on, obviously they would be alerted, they would man their guns, and um, the potential of us being cut off going out was very, very high. So I made the decision that we will not climb over and we withdrew to, to, to the RV. Now, for a very long time, I felt a bit bad about this because, you know, I didn't achieve what, what, what I had to achieve. But I was commended by all the OCs on all levels, you know, making the right decision not to attack that to save the rest of the operation. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a lesson learned by myself that in, in, in a command position, if you are in a certain um, situation, you clearly have to apply your mind as to the safety of your own people, despite of uh, the target you had to um, engage and, and conquer and um, you're getting your whole force wiped out, you know, was that the right thing? So... Um, one of the coat hangers once again in, in, in my career to, um, you know, make sound decisions based on the operational um, situation. Was this, I think we once again, <laughs> I don't know on what time scales we are, um, but of course I want to stop there. There were some on other operations I participated in as well, but um, that was the end of, of, of 82, and um, I was uh, selected to go to the military academy um, in Saldana to actually go and um, complete my studies or then, um, you, you know, do another degree. I was enrolled for a BA with political science and military history as major subjects um, and a few others. Now, I had a lot of credits because I studied BURIS but um, which was accepted for the BMOL degree. But um, I, you know, didn't, I took a full course, but, you know, you had a buffer in. So if you slipped on a, a subject for whatever reason, you had enough credits to, to carry on. But um, I didn't use that as a, as a backup. Um, and the military academy, just quickly for the people, you know, as an orientation, um, the military academy is situated in Saldana, in the uh, West Coast. And it's actually the faculty, faculty of Military Sciences of the University of Stellenbosch. Although it's a military institution, academically, it sorts under the, um, the, the, the University of Stellenbosch. So, you know, you receive your degree at the University of Stellenbosch, and, but, but it, it's run and commanded as a military unit uh, there. Um, just want to relate one or two things there. Of course, um, uh, I, 
I, we, we, we clocked in there. We were Sam Furi. We went with me to the academy and then a guy called Krik Krier. He only had one leg story for later, but in any case, the three of us was first years and then Tiu Furi was a third year and Fred Volker, who actually commanded the operation with the crocodiles they are going to talk about on Thursday, was a second year. So we were in the three year groups. There were some wreckies at the military academy. Um, uh, in any case, I was at, um, I, I got a room on Malgaskop. Now, Malgaskop is not the main, um, uh, not barracks, the accommodation. It's, it's on a cop and it's old wooden buildings, which was actually nice overlooking the old Bay of Saldana and Langaban and Mykonos and all those places. But th at that stage, was I, uh, I thought, you know, my, my whole school career or, or, or Secondary school career, I spent in a hostel and at university hostel and in messes and so on. I just decided one day, I've had enough of, of a mess. I'm going to buy a house. Now, at that stage, I was a captain and I built up, you know, good reserves in, in terms of, of savings. And uh, like a reckless young officer, I, I toured Europe at the stage and we saw the the new bmw 3 series in europe but it, it wasn't available in south africa and i said to my friend if this three series ever arrive in south africa i'm going to buy a three series and in my first year they arrived in <laughs> in south africa so i bought a, a three series um, bmw and there was two other guys at the academy that also bought three series because it will become another story later on. But in any case, I bought that. And at one reggae, I, I bought an NAD, a NAD um, sound system and a Browning pistol, nine millimeter. So my earthly possessions consisted of a, a, a three series BMW, a NAD sound system, and a brownie, and some Soviet clothes, and the rest was, was army clothes. So I went to Friedenburg. I bought a house for 32,000 Rand. Now, I, had, I didn't have money to buy anything else than the house. So I borrowed some army blankets as curtains, and I borrowed two mattresses, and I bought some planks, and I screwed them together, and I had a bed. And my sleeping bag served as, as my bedding. I had a gas bottle, a few pots, uh, a kettle, and an iron to iron my clothes. That was it. Was. As, as furniture, I used um, milk crates and so on for a long, long time. So with the house payments, with the vehicle payments, and whatever, at the end of the, when I paid everything, I think I had left about 50 rand or so to buy food and whatever. But um, my neighbor there was an attorney, Lou Hickman. He had a big firm in town. And um, the way I lived is I dived crayfish and abalone. So I basically lived on crayfish and abalone. And my dad had a way, you know, if he called you to, to ask, how are you? And so on, he wouldn't ask you, how are you? He always asks, do you have food to eat? You know, if you say yes, it means it's going well with you. So, you know, when they, my parents phoned me and they asked me, how are you? Do you have food to eat? I said, I live on crayfish and abalone. You know, and they thought, yeah, it was going very well with me. But the meantime, back at the ranch, you know, I lived like a pauper. But um, you get sick of crayfish and, and abalone at this stage. But low Hickman was you know a few years older than I am and he and his wife I used to supply them with crayfish and abalone and they would supply me with mutton and beef and pork and vegetables and you name it so I actually did live very, very well <laughs> that's just a, a small thing uh, which I wanted to relate then of course in at the end of my first year um, we, 
three of us planned to, to go and tour Malawi. Malawi was the, the only African country South Africa was, was allowed to actually visit. So we would backpack through Malawi for the whole of December and, um, you, you know, as a holiday. So um, during the last phase of that year, the one guy, Oostreis Kinneke, who was a chopper pilot, he got engaged. And, you know, he said, no, he's going to spend the December with his, you know, um, engaged or the girl. And Tinas van Staden, that was from 32, um, decided to quit. So he was, uh, uh, he went back to 32 battalion and there I was. And I said, okay, I'm still going to do it. So on my own, I flew to uh, Malawi and of course I toured Malawi for six weeks from the south to the north, walking miles, going up into the Mulanji Mountains, um, Lake Malawi, traveling on the, uh, what is it? HMS Ilala was the, the boat, you know, and getting off at, at um, some of the little harbors and hiking up to the Nika Plateau and you know, from the, fr from the south to the north. But what I realized, or what I, um, I bumped into a lot of um, overland travelers, of course. And, you know, they, they said, no, they came, you know, from England, through Egypt, through Ethiopia, through, you know, um, Somalia, and, you know, they up Zambia, Kenya, and so on. So I realized, you know, Oh, that's nice. So if you actually have a different passport, you can travel the world. But South Africans were totally banned in, in, in those areas. In any case, I, I had a really a good time in, in Malawi, went back second year, third year, and there's a few stories I can relate during those years, but uh, due to time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that. In, my, in the final year, in my third year, was on a Friday, I only had one su subject. And that was after tea in the morning. Um, and I think it was political science with Professor Louis Duplessis, who is a hero of mine and still friends up to today. But um, so on a Friday, was it was my routine. So I would go with my, um, my BMW, with my diving suit, and then in the Branavain Bay and, you know, within, <laughs> in the reserve of, of the, the military academy and the SAS Aldana, you know, everybody was at work and, you know, doing whatever they had to do. I would um, put on my diving suit and I would just collect abalone and crayfish and, you um, you know, out, put it in plastic bags, hide it in my uh, BMW so that the slime and whatever <laughs> didn't infest my vehicle. And then um, I didn't even shower. You know, I just dried myself off uh, well and then put on my step out, you know, short sleeve step out so my uniform and be in time for tea time um, at the academy. Because tea time, you've got very nice sandwiches, you know, it's an officer's thing. and you know, it's the military academy. So, you know, tea time wasn't missed. So a Friday morning played off like this. In the morning, dive crayfish in Parliament, up to the, um, to the mess, tea time, tea and tubies. And then after that, political science, and then it was a long weekend for me. So that, that was very, it, it, it was a great year. Um, or the three years at the military academy, learned a lot, um, great experience, great friends. And the, the whole of that period, uh, of course, I hardly ever took leave. You know, I, I, I deployed operationally with four recce and, and some of the other units of which I'm now not going to relate some of those stories. But then at the end of, of 85, MA85, I graduated and I was transferred to, to four recce. Um, so I didn't go back to one reiki and I cleared in, I cleared in at four reiki 
in lange baan. So, um, course, yes, I think I'm going to probably just relate a few things there and then I'm going to stop and we can carry on with my career in, in, in four Reiki, um, which was a, you know, a very nice time. But yes, transferred, cleared in at four Reiki. And um, in, during the first six months, I did all my um, basic courses at four, which is, um, you know, the, the, the C word courses, other than a diving, attack diving course. So um, by the mid uh, 86, I was fully qualified as a, as a seaborne operator um, without a diving qualifications, which I did later. Of course, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, that was my time, one Reiki, military academy, and into, into four Reiki. Into four Reiki, uh, really, you know, there, my, I want to say my operational career exploded. You know, um, we had so much opportunities, the, the nature of warfare um, changed, and, and we had a lot of other opportunities. So, of course, I'm going to stop there. I don't know if you have any questions, and I hope I didn't bore the people with, <laughs> with this story. But um, thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, I think it's impossible to be bored here. I was listening attentively, making notes. It's such a privilege for me, actually. I, I can basically ask what I want. And uh, the rest of the people, sadly, they have to leave comments. <laughs> and then hopefully <laughs> we read them. But talking about comments, uh, Plerkis was one of them who made the comment you answered it. Just want to say thank you to him. He's one of my uh, favorite commentators here. He's a former parabet. He's not a young man. He must be in his 70s now. And I think he lives in Australia or New Zealand. I'm just saying these things so that we know we're talking about the correct man. Thank you for that, Flakis. We really appreciate Now I have a question to you. As a young man, a special forces operator, now you see a woman you want to date. At what stage would she find out what you actually do? Or would she know from the beginning? Or is there any kind of... Uh, Secrecy, because at some stage you can't be secret anymore. I mean, man and wife, they share things. Well, um, yes, obviously, if you're young and virile, like most of, you know, the energetic and fit male, um, obviously you want to date um, women and so on. But I am serious with you. Yes. To answer your question directly, you know, I don't know other people, but I never said to anybody, you know, I, I was, I, I would maybe say I'm in the army, you know, if they asked, um, but I would, I wouldn't lie, but, but I would never say that I'm Reiki or, you know, part of special forces or, or whatever, you know, where are you stationed? Yes. In Durban or in, in, uh, in Langebaan, what do you do now? We go to the border, you know, and you kind of just talk it away. But um, in Durban itself, you know, we used to date girls from the, the, the teachers' college, and, and they, they all knew, you know, where we are from and, and what we actually did. And it's, it's good that you asked this question. At the end of, of 82, myself and a friend, PJ Furi, we... we we drove down to Cape Town. PJ's um, family stays in, 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 in Cape Town. And our doctor that was serving with us, Andre Laram, also stayed in Cape Town. And he also went to Cape Town for the, for the December um, holidays um, or Christmas break. And we decided we'll, we'll meet at the La Perla restaurant in Cape Point. Now, La Parla is a smart restaurant and, you know, a posh place. So he, he was getting engaged to a, to a lady and, you know, he said he's, he's bringing his uh, um, fiance. So myself and PJ said, Andre, now, you know, you're going to sit there with your girl. So why don't you organize us dates? 
and um, you know, ask your your fiance. I mean, she's still at varsity, so it shouldn't be difficult to organize that. Cut the long story short, when we arrived at um, La Perla, Andre was there with his um, fiance, and he in fact did bring another girl along with him. And um, so it was Andre, his fiance, myself, PJ, and one other girl. And really, you know, this lady which she brought was catching the eye. You know, intelligent conversation. Um, I think at that stage she was doing her honors in I don't know what. So, you know, she was blonde, but not the blonde with a with a <laughs> you, you know, she had something between the ears as well. And she was really attractive. In fact, there was a bit of a competition going on between myself and PJ to see who could now, you know, make a move onto this lady. And um, at the end of the night, um, you know, he asked her for a telephone number and, and whatever. And she said, no, you know, you can get it from Andre at the stage and, and so on. And, you know, I also asked at the stage. And in any case, just before we left, she slipped me a piece of paper with a telephone number. on. So I thought, mm, maybe, maybe I made the, you know, the right thing. Of course, but um, also to cut the long story short and to answer your question, yes, we never told them what we were. But um, that lady I met at um, La Perla that night um, wears the diamond on her finger which I bought in Israel. So I eventually married that lady. Elian Steenkamp, her father was a, a, a Dutch reformed uh, Dwemeni. And uh, yeah, we are still married up to today. But um, yes, never flogged and opened it up you know, what we really did. Well, if we if like I answer a, your question. Yes, we like a romantic story here. Yeah? And I'm very sure Rebecca is going to insist upon a, a picture <laughs> of a wife. But we had to ask last week, you know, my friend, <laughs> on Suki Colonel net for so three years a week. <laughs> you haven't then, commented on that yet. <laughs> Okay, now somebody contacted me privately and, and asked me whether there's some kind of a Fourri syndrome or syndicate in special forces, because it seems to be that there were a lot of Fourris in that, in, in that unit. <laughs> Would you care to comment? <laughs> yes, you know, that is very interesting quiz. Yes, I want to start with, I think the, 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 the oldest guy that, that was in first was probably um, Davi Fourri. Um, the one that I went to Israel with um, that did the first, you know, that uh, um, anti-terror course. Then I think the, the second um, Furi was Thieu Furi. Um, yeah, Thieu is, is, is also the son of a, of a Dwemeni and a very, very naughty guy. But uh, he was also at the, at the military academy. Then it was Sam Fury, it was Esvia Fury. There's, there's more. I think we were seven Furies in, in, in special forces at this stage. So, um, and coincidence, coincidentally, none of us were actually related to one another. But yes, you know, and we were very proud, you know, a person like Yopi Fury did his thing in the Boer War. So, you know, we, we tried to carry the Furi thing high. <laughs> well, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. I have to ask you, when you went to Malawi, uh, I think Dr. Banda was still in charge. Yes. Now, he had the thing about long hair and hippies. Yes. I don't know if you recall that. that if yes, you very well. That airport, yes, very well. Perhaps we should just tell the people here about that little bit of history in Africa. Yeah. It was Hastings Banda. Uh, Dr. Reistings Banda. Um, he, he, I think he was one of the, the real 
democratic and good leaders in Africa. Uh, he didn't tolerate any, I want to, not in a derogative way, but call it liberalism. You know, um, there was laws out, no long hair, um, men, you don't wear shorts, you may wear, uh, you know, a, a swimming trunk if you swim, but, uh, you know, you had to wear uh, trousers, ladies, mini skirts, and stuff like that, totally out. You weren't allowed to do that. Um, and, you know, on the Malawi Lake, there's really nice places to swim and bathe and, and, and so on. No, bikinis wasn't allowed. You could, ladies couldn't wear bikinis. You know, it was a, 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 a full piece swimming um, trunk or suit they had to wear. Um, and he had very strict rules. But that, I can tell you that, course, in that time, Malawi was clean. There wasn't a paper or a, a bottle top lying on the ground. You know, I, he really ran that, that country so well. When I went back about five years ago, I, I was so disgusted in, you know, how Malawi actually um, deteriorated in, in terms of that. Although the people, the Malawi people is a really friendly people, well-educated, and, and I have a lot of respect for the Malawian people. I don't know if I answered the, your, your question. Or... No, you did perfectly. I know that the ban was extended to um, bell-bottom jeans. Not that I'm sure what that is, actually, but I knew yeah. we had a problem with those new way things. And these were yeah, the yeah. 70s and later the 80s, you know, men had long hair. It was yeah. the, the, in, the in thing. Yeah. But now, now I just want to say quickly, if you have Balo, he's very welcome here. Because I've seen what these private military companies can actually do. And they yeah. do a lot of good. Yes. But it's very interesting to me that you said that they are not really allowed to succeed too far because that would interfere in the big powers, major powers as policies. But I've never seen them do anything which is really bad. In fact, but that does not, what we can perhaps do is once we have Evan Balo and a few of them here, they can explain themselves, which is easier. Yeah. Then the second last question is people are gonna ask, how's my ankle? <laughs> Doing very well, Chris. Thank you very much for the concern. You know, it's, I think day by day we are gaining. Um, I was a bit disappointed that the doctor put me into this moon boot for another five weeks and said, you know, don't walk on it. But it's much more comfortable. You know, I can take it off at night when I'm not um, walking around and at least I can get into a shower and have a decent shower. But uh, it, it's really progressing well. Thank you, Chris. Well, Colonel, I, I know it's not the, the in thing for South Africans to talk about medals. It's, we follow the British tradition, I would say. But I do know that you, you won the Honoris Crux at Ops Kerslach. And for those who don't know, the Honoris Crux is a medal for bravery. And it's not easily bestowed. You really had to do something, something brave. Uh, it's for valor. I want to, if you wish to answer me, if you can tell me about the medal. You've already described what happened that day or that night when you went back with your comrades to uh, find Koki and his people, and you got two or three out. If you wish to comment upon it, so this is the time. If you don't want to comment on it, that's that's good also. Of course, um, maybe I I can say in 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 Kerslach, there was four honoris cruxes awarded. Um, the, the, to Jack Grief for the role he played, for Sam Fury the role he played, myself, and then Jaapie Kloppers. So during Operation Kerslach. Um, yes, four Norris Cruxes was awarded. And may I say with every reason in the book as well, because what you people did there was just beyond belief. I, I have to ask you something here. I found out through various sources, and it is in some books, that, that something unpleasant happened after Kerslach. That's basically. 
uh, with the senior officers, perhaps they made errors of judgment. I'm not here to judge. But can, if, if you're aware of what I'm talking about, sir, can you please tell us? Yes, of course. No, I'm, I'm thoroughly aware of it. I mean, um, you know, we were exposed to uh, and we used the equipment. Now, um, the mines was prepared by EMLZ. I told you earlier on that we had this um, organization that actually, you know, built all funnies for us and so on. So uh, the mines was actually um, made by um, EMLC and there was a lot of um, aluminium dust integrated with, with the um, PE4 and the explosives. Why? It creates um, a very high temperature and it actually ignites um, the oil, etc. Now, the mechanisms that was used was, was uh, and it's actually a, a Russian um, method. Uh, it cuts when you when you draw the pin. It cuts through lead. So um, it's got a spring. And then it pulls a, a little wire through a piece of lead and it, and it cuts through the lead. And I mean, that is timed, you know, over and over and over. So very important, the consistency of the lead you use must be of, you know, under very, very high, high control. Now, another thing that happens is if lead heats up, the wire cuts through the lead faster. And, um, you know, the, the, the EMLC guys gave us a lot of training on the, There was a light that actually came on to say, okay, it's armed now. And if you pull the pin, a, a little red light went on, which indicated it's now starting to cut through the, um, the lead. So there was a lot of debate going on. Um, obviously, EMLC, whoever, um, you know, they defended themselves in terms of there was nothing wrong with the mechanisms and the mines and so on. So it must, it must be an operator mistake. But, you know, what mistake can you really make? So... And 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 um, Pit Feige and Cook um, Kloppies, you know, they they testified that you know they they went through the correct procedures of of pull, you know pulling the pins and seeing the little lights coming on and and whatever. So there was a, a toss up between um, the operators who defended the operator, obviously, and um, the the people that made the mines to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with their, um, with their mechanisms. But yes, there was big debates in our, in our board um, conference center in, in Durban, you know, where, you know, we were very unhappy about, about the situation. But um, to cut the long story short, I, you know, you don't get anywhere if you play the blame game. You know, um, so by, you know, the one party blaming the other parties it, is the wrong way to actually try and derive to what went wrong. So, you know, we went through a process and, and you know, I, I actually at the stage, you know, stopped this whole allegation thing. And I said, you know, it's not going to bring us anywhere or take us anywhere. And let's logically, and there's slum, slum guys, you know, um, um, Sabi that was in charge of EMLC, yeah, he's, a, he's an engineer and he's a clever guy, he's clever people there. So, you know, they really went through a process of, of what could have gone wrong. Was, was some tanks warmer than the other, whatever. But as it may be, the explosion occurred where Cocky pulled the pin, because when he pulled the pin, it exploded. So it can't cut through the lead that fast. So you know that remained always remained a, a, a you know a question in the whole argument. And then you know as I've said, Katiso 
was the following operation where we knocked out the the, the Baira uh, tank farm. And we all said, there's no way that we will use the same, the operator said that. We're not going to use the same mechanisms which was used in the mines which we used on Kerslach. And EMLC accepted that. And, you know, they changed the, the uh, mechanisms in the mines. So to answer your question, yes, there was debate about it. I don't think it is, um, you know, senior officers that was necessarily involved. It was a thing um, which was debated. And obviously, you know, commanders is commanders. And, and the manager, uh, Wumsebi of EMLC, is, was a senior officer. So one could very easily say senior officers. But... I don't think I think it's the wrong approach to say to senior officers fighting about it. It was professional people on their um, appointment that actually debated the story. And yes, it was there was heated arguments about it. Yes, but it changed. So it was a search of truth. It was not really yes. a blame game. Yes. It was more like look, something went wrong. We're going yeah. to do this again. We need answers. Exactly. And, and and it was clear. And and afterwards we had you know the, there was no problems with with the mechanisms and, and the mines EMLC made. Well, that's how we learn through experience. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes it costs lives, but that's how we learn. It would be worse if it costs life and you, and you didn't learn anything. That would yeah. be absolutely a disgrace. Absolutely. Well, we've come to the end of the third episode, and I really hope there's many more. I must tell you, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter. People will watch. And if they don't, they can press the pause button, but they won't. They will be watching all the time. And, and they will enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed it and all the comments. We thank you for that once again. I want to tell all of you listening here, I always say that at the end of every video, none of you were unimportant. Yes, in South Africa, I, I do realize we never spoke about our experiences. It just wasn't a done thing and nobody really cared anyway. But those times are gone now. And we now here where we need to talk before it's too late. And also for legal reasons. If you don't put your statement on, then any lawyer will tell you the other side has to be believed because it's the only version. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get a balanced view so that people can judge us later. And we don't mind being judged. We've got nothing to be ashamed of. So I ask you once again, if you wish to tell your story to me, I'm probably only going to get you in February next year because we've really been booked ahead. But that's not a problem. Get in, get hold of me, contact me. Uh, let us hear what, what, what you experienced. And as I always say to you, until we meet again, God bless. Thank you very much, Quas.